The Lost Generation, Episode 1. Thunder crashed over the roar of heavy engines. The stench of diesel and scorched earth saturated the atmosphere. The driller's break was just about over. He savored the last drag on his sim. He could have sworn he just lit the damn thing. As he grounded out on the loose black scree, his body had already started fiending for another one. He ignored it and joined the rest of his shift on the long descent into the site. He passed a fleet of hauler vats. The massive spherical vehicles floated on a bed of AG as their vacuum tubes collected the shattered lava for processing. Further ahead, there were scrapers. Their blades whined like banshees as they sawed into the rock. Reaching his own scraper, he banged on the window. Eventually, the driver powered down and climbed out. The driller didn't know this new guy. He wasn't going to bother trying. Not at the rate the court burned through employees. The driller climbed in and got to work. Over the next hour, the driller carved another 30 feet of lava. He could barely hear his music over the screaming blades and chugging engine. There was definitely going to be another trip to the ear doctor in his future. He needed to finish his certification and get out of the pits before his ears went for good. Suddenly, the wall ahead collapsed. The computer flashed a warning and the driller quickly cut the blades. He must have hit a pocket of what passed for air on this planet, or some other gas. He waited and hoped the tunnel ceiling would hold. The drizzle of pebbles eventually stopped. He grabbed his air sensor and climbed out. Company protocol strictly stipulated that pockets had to be tested for flammable gases before the machine could resume work. The driller moved past the scraper's blades, still steaming in the cold air, and started scanning in front of the machine. Seemed all clear, not hazardous at least. He moved forward, trying to see what could have caused the collapse. That's when he saw it. The sensor clattered to the ground. The junk world of Spider in the Cathcart system was allegedly a neutral zone for pirates, fugitives, and others of ill repute. It was anything but safe at the moment as Tanya Oriel, rogue scientist and explorer, sprinted through the narrow warped halls. This was getting to become a habit. The payoff from the Curium score on Hades was even bigger than she'd hoped. Most of it immediately disappeared into the maw of creditors and loan sharks that were banging on her proverbial door. Another chunk enabled her to trade up to a sweeter ship, but the remainder was going toward a treat. A Taveran Codex, the original text for their warrior religion. Only a couple dozen still existed after the purge of the Second Taveran War. Various museums and collectors had snatched all the known volumes up. But somehow, this fixer got one. Only after Tanya showed up and paid did he suddenly realize its value and tripled his price. So Tanya grabbed it and ran. A laser blast zipped past her head and seared the wall. Tanya glanced back. It was Nadia, the plunderer, loping after her with his bad leg, a gun, and a foul expression. You got nowhere to run, gal! He screamed and snapped off another shot. We had a deal, Nadia! She yelled back, without slowing down. Nadia fired again as punctuation. That doesn't make any sense! Tanya burst past an arriving crew and cut down toward the hangars. They quickly obliged the lunatic with the gun. Nadia feverishly yelled for his crew over his calm. Fortunately, they were too intoxicated to notice. Nadia puffed away as his feet thundered on the metal floors. His head started to feel light. He hadn't run like this for some time. He wheeled around the corner of the hangar as engines flared to life, blasting him back through the door. Ah! 
Tanya powered up the beacon tube remotely, one of her ship's new fancy tricks. She raced up the boarding ramp. As she slid into the pilot seat, Nagia swung back inside the hangar and fired at the cockpit. The shields barely flashed as they absorbed his shots. It was like throwing pebbles at a dreadnought. Nagia ran over to flag down the deck guards, the ones manning the turrets. Tanya didn't wait around to see if he got their attention. Nagia watched the flare of her engines disappear into the distance. He was going to get her. He just had to figure out how. After a few moments, he gave up and returned to the bar. With Spider firmly in the distance, Tanya set her course. She knew a meal of real food, a glass of wine, and her new codex were all she needed to forget the unpleasantness of her business with Nagia. A message popped on her screen. She assumed it was a job. The details were written in evasive legalese, but there was a payout just to hear the offer. Three days away if she left now. It looked like real food was going to have to wait. The Beacon 2 dropped through the atmosphere into a massive electrical storm. Tanya passed over vast trenches of land, excised and chopped up before landing at Shubin Interstellar's on-site corporate headquarters. A pair of security escorted her into a small white room. A tall, gaunt lawyer smiled pleasantly before going over dozens of confidentiality agreements and other legal fine print. She scanned text until her eyes ached. After an hour, she interrupted him. Could you at least tell me what the job is? I'm sorry, miss. The lawyer said with a yellowed grin. I'm bound not to disclose any pertinent details until you've properly filled out the- Fine, fine, I get it. She slumped against the table. The lawyer continued. She gave verbal consents, a handful of fingerprints, even signed. Finally, the lawyer seemed satisfied. She peered up at him expectantly. No blood? Urine? The lawyer looked at her, puzzled. No, miss. I don't believe that will be necessary. So what now? The introductory fee is currently being transferred to your account. The lawyer stood and let her out. They walked through pristine white halls. He stopped outside another door and placed his thumb against the lock. It slid open, revealing a larger conference room. A thick rectangular window looked out over the dig site. Tanya stepped inside and looked at the people inside. She recognized most of them. Deke Johnson, Squig Bentley, Arthur Morrow. These were other explorers in the loosest sense of the word. They were grave robbers, plunderers, drunks, and junkies who dabbled in history. If these were Tanya's competition, she was mildly offended to be on a list with these degenerates. Well, well, well. A voice said behind her. Tanya froze recognizing it instantly. Fancy seeing you here. Tanya turned around. Sinzin Turov flashed that megawatt smile of his. Good to see you, Tanya. He stepped in for a hug. Tanya stopped him with a hand to his chest and pushed him back. He feigned offense. Hey, what gives? I just showered. Ah, oh, come on, Tanya. You aren't still sore about it. About you robbing me blind? Tanya looked out the window. I think I'm over it. I hope so. You stole my ship. And sold it to pirates. With those Shion relics, you could buy two more. <laughs> Three, actually. Sinzen stretched and leaned against the wall beside her. He scanned the room, visibly bored. Any idea what this is all about? Nope. Maybe we should team up. Like the old days? I'd rather run with Squig. Tanya said. At that perfect moment, Squig belched and farted at the same time. <laughs> he seemed quite pleased with himself. Yeah, well, the Tanya I knew needed a man who was her equal. Someone to challenge her. Sinzen leaned a little closer. Tanya looked at him. Their eyes locked. Is this what you think you are? A <laughs> man? My equal. The door slid open. Gavin Arlington, CEO of Shubin, strode into the room. He almost didn't look real. Every hair, wrinkle, and crease in his suit seemed as if it had a purpose. 
as if he demanded the same efficiency from his body that he did from his workers. An army of stoic assistants and the site foreman flanked him. His emerald eyes quickly assessed the riffraff in the room. Come with me. Arlington led them outside. All of the mining operations within earshot had been shut down. There was only the howling wind, the now distant thunder, and the crunch of gravel under their feet as they moved towards the pits. Forty-five minutes of silent march passed. Sinzen glanced at Tanya, genuinely baffled. She shrugged and shook her head. This was really bizarre. They were approaching a new cutting, shrouded in darkness as the sun set ahead of them. Arlington stopped at the edge of the shadow beside one of the scrapers. Deke Johnson stumbled and nearly fell. Arlington turned back to the group. No doubt you're wondering why I called you here. Arlington said with a dismissive glance towards Deke. He then nodded to the foreman. The newly cut gash flared up with light. It took everyone a second to adjust. Tanya squinted and focused on a bright irregularity in the middle of the black mass ahead. Embedded in the wall of lava, there was a smooth metallic facing, but this was an ore or a mineral vein. It was molded, constructed plate. Tanya's first instinct was that it was wreckage of some kind. That wasn't the startling thing. There was one faded word stenciled across its surface. Artemis. This is Captain Bane. Thank you for taking the time to listen to SC Lorecast's telling of The Lost Generation, Episode 1 by David Haddock. This official Star Citizen lore can be found within the Spectrum Dispatch section of the Roberts Space Industries website. I am personally enjoying the return of Tanya Oriel, as her previous adventure in the Hades system was the subject of my very first Lorecast. I'm excited to bring to you the remaining nine episodes in this series, and hope you enjoy listening as much as I will enjoy producing them. As always, I am grateful for the support and dedication of my talented voice actors, and I'm proud to announce that we have a special guest speaker playing the role of Gavin Arlington, the CEO of Shubin Interstellar. You may know him as STL Youngblood, and he is one of the elite Star Citizen content creators. If by some fluke you are unfamiliar with his work, I strongly suggest you check out his YouTube channel, where you will find updates, tips, tricks, advice, and guides about the hottest space sims and adventure games. As you might expect, a direct link is in the description, and I would very much appreciate you showing him some support on my behalf. Who knows, maybe I can talk him into taking part in future Lorecasts. Now I would like to offer a special thank you to my latest Patreon supporter, Cantera Sun. In addition to forking out his hard-earned money to help me do what I do, he also happens to be the president and CEO of Barrington, a star citizen organization dedicated to the less combat-oriented career paths. If you want to explore, mine, haul, or conduct research and development, and still be able to call on the resources of a full-fledged organization for support, I suggest you check them out. The Spectrum ID is BRT, that's Bravo Romeo Tango. Finally, I have a lot of opportunities presenting themselves, so I suspect that in the next few weeks I will have some exciting announcements about SC Lorecast partnering with new and existing Star Citizen-related platforms. Stay tuned for more details, and as always, for you Star Citizen fans out there, we'll see you in the verse.